Um, all right, I'm putting a link to the slides in the chat and I am going to share my screen. Um, thanks everybody for being here. And thanks especially to Sam for facilitating this today. So uh, here we go. As Sam said, this session is called Share Your Scholarship, Track Your Citations, Choosing the Best Researcher Profile Systems for You. And the slides link is here um, on this first slide. It's in the chat and Sam will share it after the session in the follow-up message. So this is me, I'm Anna Kraft. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the coordinator of scholarly communications here in the university libraries. And some things you might be thinking about in this context as we're getting into the information for this session. So how do I make my research stand out? How do I make sure that people can find my research? How do I make, my, make sure that my research is attributed to me? and not to someone who maybe has a similar name or even the same name who might be uh, doing research in the same discipline or one that's similar. And how can I determine how my work is being cited and used? This is a frequent question that people have, especially around promotion, tenure, and review. So if you're interested in any of those things, then you are in the right place. So today we're going to talk about research identity and what that means and why managing it can be important. We'll briefly look at some freely available and widely used researcher identity management systems, and hopefully we'll find some that are going to be useful to you. And these are some of the ones, we won't talk about all of these today, but these are some of the ones that you may be aware of that are out there um, in the world. So first, research and researcher identity. What is this? So um, this can be a lot of different things. It could be profiles online and some of these systems that we're going to talk about that list your publications and your other research activities. It could be your affiliations with institutions like UNCG and other research or academic institutions. It could include citations from others of your research and publications. It could include your research collaborations your peer review and editorial activities, even the way that your name appears, how you have that written on your publications. And do you need to manage this? If you're going to publish, especially in journals, and you wanna track citations, this can be extremely helpful. If you're gonna be applying for grant funding, especially federal grants, some of them may actually require that you use one or more of these identifiers. If you wanna make sure that your scholarship is attributed to you and not someone who has a similar name, then this can help you. And if you wanna help make your research visible to others who might read and cite your work or collaborate with you or fund you, this can help you there too. So all of these things can be very useful at any stage in your career, but especially for those that are tenure track and looking to show impact. What do these research profiles and systems offer? It really varies. So usually there's some information about your publication. This might include citations, links, and full or maybe full text versions. Um, citation tracking, so tracking others' citations of your works, as well as other potential usage metrics. There may be unique identifiers, so a number that might be assigned to you that will help distinguish you from other researchers. They might include info about your research interests and maybe connections to profiles or identifiers of co-authors or collaborators. How do you choose which ones to use? So some of these systems are actually only available in uh, limited circumstances. Some of them are widely available. Some of them um, may be more limited. So looking at what's available to you. Some systems, have much bigger indexes or sort of databases of work that is held in them. So for example, one we'll talk about is Google Scholar Citations and Google indexes a whole lot of content. And it's generally more than some of the others that are out there. So some of these systems may include more of your work or uh, more in your discipline than some others. Some funders and publishers may require certain identifiers your colleagues or collaborators or mentors might use or recommend certain systems, so it's good to see what others are using. And in relation to the systems that index your work or maybe have more work in their databases, 
those are probably the ones that are going to have better metrics for you. So the more of your stuff and the more of the citations that are available in a certain system means that you're probably going to have better metrics. And it's fine to, to make decisions based on that as well. Open access may be a consideration for some people, as well as business practices. So we'll talk just a little bit about that in terms of the for-profit or non-profit aspect of some of these systems and what some of them may be doing with data. All right, so let's dive in. And of course, at any point, if y'all have questions, please enter them in the chat. So these are the ones that we're going to talk about today, some of them in a little more depth than others. And there are other systems that are out there. Uh, we don't have time to cover everything today. So this is just kind of a taste. And I also want to note that I don't actually recommend all of the systems that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I'll, I'll share more about that as we get into this. And if you have opinions or experiences with these systems, please share in the chat and we'll have hopefully some time at the end for a little more conversation and questions too. So the four, first one we're going to talk about is ORCID. And ORCID stands for the Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. This is a persistent digital author identifier. It's a string of numbers, and it provides authoritative identification of your, your works, your articles generally, and maybe your grants as well with your ID number. So this distinguishes you from other researchers and makes sure that your work shows up with you. And it is integrated in a lot of different places. A lot of publishers and funders and different databases use ORCID. So this is pr probably the biggest one that we're going to be talking about today. Um, their goal is for people to be able to enter their data once and reuse that data often. And they're a nonprofit. So they make it very easy to sign up for an identifier. A little information is shown here. And this is an example of a profile. So this is for one of our researchers, Nick Oberlees, and we see his ORCID ID, that number in the upper left, that string of numbers, and these green rectangles that we can see are places where a researcher might choose to enter data about themselves. So information about your employment, your education, your service. So those first three are places where you can enter whatever you want or nothing. And then the works piece is where the system is doing the work for you. So works that are associated with your ID number are going to populate the system. And this is making sure that it's work that is actually by you and you're getting that authoritative link. It's not going to take you necessarily to an open access version. This isn't that kind of database. It's just going to take you to the publisher website generally. And from there, access is really going to depend on does your library subscribe? Do you subscribe? Something like that. You can enter information about uh, links to your own website, as well as links to other identifiers that you have, and you can see those on the left. And here's an example of how you might, one way, another way that you might interact with ORCID out in um, your academic life. So this is a journal that I'm involved with. It's called Serials Review, and you can log in with your username and password, or you can log in with your ORCID identifier. And using that, will make sure that this journal knows that, oh, this is a, this person is also in the ORCID database and anything that they publish is also going to be associated automatically with their ORCID ID, which can be really helpful. So why would you use this? This can help disambiguate your name and your research from others who may have similar names and similar research. It can authoritatively identify you and your scholarly work to publishers, funders, and others. And some funders and publishers actually require that you have one of these. When you use an ORCID, it can help uh, provide automatic updates on your profile when manuscripts are published or grants are awarded. And I don't have direct experience with this, but for uh, some grant related publications, if it's linked to your ORCID, it actually can be automatically deposited, I think in systems like PubMed. Um, so there is some sort of, because ORCID is integrated in so many places, there are some benefits that um, in terms of automatic processes where otherwise you might have to do things yourself. How do you get one? You can register online. It's very easy. So I've got that link here. 
add a little more information at an additional link. Okay, moving right along. Uh, our next one is Google Scholar citations. So this one is related to Google Scholar, a database that I think many of us know and use when we're doing searches. The, when you go to the Google Scholar main page, in the upper left, you'll see a little link for my profile. And that's where you go to either create or access your Google Scholar citations profile. So this creates a profile for you that groups together all your publications that are indexed by Google. And for most people, this is going to be probably the largest representation of their work that's available in one of these uh, research identity systems. It will also track citations of your work and graph them over time and compute some citation metrics. They don't share a lot of information, though, about what all and how much is in their contents index. They're a little uh, closed in terms of that. And they are, of course, a for-profit company. So here, of course, is the Google Scholar main page. And we see on the upper left that My Profile link. And here's an example of a profile for one of our researchers. So we see just a little bit of information about her. And then on the left, we see a list of her works with those citations. Again, if you click through, this won't necessarily take you to the article. It will generally take you to the publisher's website where you may or may not hit a paywall. We also see how many times these articles have been cited and when they were published. And on the right, we see a little bit more about those citations, the citation numbers, the H index, the I-10 index. So it's calculating some metrics and we see a graph over time of her productivity. And for people who have um, funding mandates for public access, there also is a little bit of information about articles that may or may not be available uh, publicly because of those funding mandates. Why would you set up one of these profiles? So this is one of my favorites for tracking citations. For most people, it's probably going to have the best representation of your citations. And it will also show a couple of other metrics as well. And it's very easy to edit, and it's a scholarly profile that can go with you, whether you're at UNCG or somewhere else. So this is, uh, this is a good one for many people. You can register online. I recommend that when you're initially setting it up, you consider using your personal Gmail if you have one. Uh, you can sign up using your university, your UNCG email. The issue is that if you lose access to your UNCG email in the future, say by moving to another institution, you might also lose your login. Um, and you can uh, create a new profile if that happens and re, uh, repopulate it, but it can be time consuming if you've got a lot of stuff in there. So this is just something to consider. It's not a, a huge deal either way. Okay, our next one is Scopus Author ID. And this is an identifier that you don't sign up for. This one is actually automatically assigned by Scopus, which is a, a, a product of Elsevier. It creates a profile that is managed by Scopus that will show citation counts and some visualizations and other metrics. And this is actually one that you can't sign up for or edit, and it's only available to authors that have papers that are published in journals indexed by Scopus. So from their website, the last time I checked, it said they have about 82 million documents that are indexed. Uh, I don't know how that exactly compares to Google Scholar. I just know that it is smaller. Um, and again, they are, of course, a for-profit company that is owned by Elsevier. Here's an example of a profile. So it tells you right off, right at the top, this author profile is generated by Scopus. And we have the researcher's name. It tells us that they're at UNCG. And then we see a little bit of info about metrics for them, the number of documents that Scopus holds on them, the number of citations, their H index, and then we see some of that tracked over time. If we scroll down, we would see a list of their publications. So we'd see very similar to in the other systems we've looked at so far, what's the article title, who are the authors, where was this published and when. And again, you are likely to hit a paywall with some of these if you're trying to get access to something that we don't subscribe to. Why would you use this? 
This will give you another picture of citations. It will probably be different than Google Scholar. It, for most people, is going to be lower. Uh, and it will show some metrics and visualizations. And this is actually generated whether you want it or not. So it may be helpful to check and see if you have a profile and to make sure that the information is accurate. While you can't edit your own profile, you can submit change requests to Scopus. So how do you find and maybe suggest corrections for one of these? I've got a link here and you can search using your name and affiliation or your ORCID ID. Look at your profile, see if it's correct, and you can submit changes to Scopus. And one of the things that I see most commonly with this one is that Scopus won't necessarily recognize that a person has moved to a new institution. So say I started out my career somewhere else, say I was at UVA, and Scopus created a profile for everything that I published there. And then I moved to UNCG and I started publishing here. And it might create a separate profile for me at UNCG. So uh, I, I've seen a number of situations where profiles need to be merged. So that might be something that you would want to look at if you have been at different institutions and publishing at those different institutions. All right, next up is Web of Science Researcher ID. So there is a product that the library does not subscribe to called Web of Science, and that's associated with this Web of Science Researcher ID. But Anyone can sign up for one of these accounts. There's not a, a requirement that you're at an institution that uses Web of Science. And this does some similar things to what we've looked at so far. It will track publications and citations, but it also tracks peer review and editorial activities if you are doing those activities in a journal that uses the Publons review and editorial system. So it won't show what you have written or who you have reviewed. It just will show a count of, uh, to show your activity in that area. It will also calculate your H index score, so some metrics. And unlike the others that we've looked at, this one will provide alt metric scores. And I'll say more about that in a moment. It will link to ORCID and some social media accounts. And from their website, um, last time I checked, it said their core collection is 82 million records, so about the size of Scopus, and their whole platform is 182 million records. And I don't know exactly what the difference is in terms of what will show uh, with researcher ID, um, but in my experience, I think it's probably the larger number because for most people, I have seen larger, so scope is probably as the smallest number of citations than Researcher ID and then Google Scholar. And they are, of course, a for-profit company. So we're looking at Nick Oberly's again in terms of the profile here. So we see his name. We also see right near the top that he's a top peer reviewer. So he is active in journals that use this Publons system that is tracked here in Researcher ID. So we see his publication numbers, number of times he's been cited, his H index, and that he's got 230 verified reviews. So he's very active as a reviewer. And we've got these graphs as well. So the number of citations, the number of publications, and the number of reviews as well. We see a little bit more information about publication metrics when we scroll down and review metrics as well. And then the alt metrics piece. So this is something that I I haven't seen in the other systems that we're looking at today. And it's not actually something you can look at on other people's profiles. It will only show this altmetric information to the author when you're logged in. So what is this? The citation metrics we've talked about so far, are they're, they've been calculating numbers of citations. Altmetrics looks at different views on how your work might be, be uh, used and where it's being talked about. Um, so maybe blogs, Twitter, people who are reading it on Mendeley, which we'll also talk about. So this is some alternative views on how, um, how things are being used out in the world. And they call this an attention score. So we can see the attention score for this particular article when I did this screen cap was 12. I don't have anything to compare that to other than what it says right there in the top 25% of all research outputs scored by Altmetric. So that sounds nice. Um, 
But so again, this is something that you can check on for yourself to get maybe another view on how your work is being used, um, especially if it's something that you think has made an impact more with social media and things like that. And they also have these beam plots. I have not taken the time to dive into what exactly this means, but if this is the sort of thing that you like, they have all kinds of stuff in there that will show these kinds of visualizations about your work. Why would you use this? Again, you can track citations, you can get some metrics, including those alt metrics. You can track and visualize your peer review and editorial activities if you're using that Publons system for reviews. And this one is, it's more feature rich than the others we've looked at so far, but it, that also at, on the flip side makes it a little more complicated. So if you don't have a lot of time and you're not interested in the review and alt metric pieces, then this one may not be the right so, uh, solution for you. But if you do like diving into these things and you do wanna see alt metrics on your work, um, then this might be worth checking out. How do you register? There's a pretty easy sign up and the Go link here will take you to that. Okay, we're switching gears here a little bit to talk about um, first academia.edu. So this is not one of my favorites. And this one, even just their name is a little bit deceptive. The, uh, this site was grandfathered in. It's not actually a site or attached to or associated with an educational institution. Not just anyone can get that .edu email or web address now. Um, and this makes it seem more maybe official than it actually is. So they do allow researchers to create profiles and they will let you upload copies of your papers. Um, which I would encourage people to think critically about what is happening um, to those papers and whether or not maybe you have copyright permission to do that. The site does state that their goal is open access for all articles that have ever been written, but their um, model is actually at odds with open access because they don't openly allow people to access content on the site. You have to have an account to view or download papers, which is not open access. Open access means there is no barrier, no sign in, no paywall. Um, and while there is no paywall, um, there is a sign in barrier. So this is not actually an open access model. They do have free accounts that you can sign up for as well as premium ones. I don't actually know what you would get with that premium account. And they are very interested in getting people's data, but their site is very opaque in terms of sharing what they will do with that data. Um, and they are a for-profit company. So this is one that I would um, think critically about. I, I'm sure, I mean, there are many people that use it. People may find that it is valuable to, to what they're doing. So um, the choice is yours. ResearchGate is kind of similar. Um, but this is one, so I don't actually use it, but it's one that I have, uh, as a person without a profile, I have gotten some value from this site, from their Q&A feature. So in my understanding, they're somewhat similar to academia.edu. Researchers can create profiles and upload their works, but there's also this Q&A piece. Um, and that's where I have used this because it often comes up in Google searches, uh, Often when I'm doing, trying to figure out whether a journal is predatory or quality and looking at experiences that people have had, the Q&A on ResearchGate will come up in uh, Google searches when people are talking about their own experiences with certain journals. And that can be in some situations, a, a nice way to figure out what experiences people have actually had. So I, I think the site can add some value. Um, but again, I would encourage thinking critically about how you're using it and what info you're providing to them. So you do have to have an email address at a recognized educational or research institution in order to sign up. And they do actually allow free downloads of papers, although they will bombard you with pop-ups to request that you sign up for an account. They are known for sending unsolicited and potentially kind of deceptive invitations for people to sign up. I don't know if this is still happening, but it was a practice in the past. 
And they are a little more open about their um, their model when you look at their website. The last time I looked at it, it talked in detail about their highly targeted advertising. Um, so know that when you are on the site, they are trying to sell you things. It may be related to research. Um, and they also do partnerships with companies and they may be providing your data to companies as well. They are, of course, a for-profit company. So this is another one that I would um, say if if it is if you're finding that it brings value to you, that's great. Um, but also think critically about the site and its practices. Okay, moving right along, we're going to talk about Mendeley. And this is another one that is actually owned by Elsevier. So like Scopus, this is an Elsevier product. And this is a, a reference manager, but it also has some kind of um, additional and collaborative features, such as job postings. Again, they offer free and premium accounts here, and it's available as a software you can download, a web app, and mobile apps. And this is one that I haven't used myself. It's one that I see mentioned in these conversations about this area. So I'm curious about if others have used it and would be interested in sharing about it. And while we're on this topic, I do want to point out that we, of course, have a citation manager that we support here at UNCG, and that's Zotero. So it doesn't offer job postings or maybe all the features that Mendeley has, but it will definitely support you with your citation management. And we've got a great guide here and a tutorial that can help you with your Zotero work. And the liaison librarians are awesome at supporting people with this as well. Okay, the next one that I want to talk about is the Open Science Framework. And this one, again, is a little bit different. So this is another nonprofit, and they have a free open platform that supports research and enables collaboration. And it supports the process, not just the final products. So what we've been looking at mostly are tools that support sharing uh, your citations, tracking your citations. So for those things that are finished, OSF is more about that process. So it allows users to create studies and projects, invite collaborators, store and share materials. And that might include not just finished things, but maybe data, preprints, other things. And it integrates with a lot of different systems, ORCID, Google Scholar, Zotero, Mendeley, et cetera, et cetera. This is one that I'm still learning about. It has a lot of functionality. And the way that I have used it the most frequently is in relation to um, conferences, where a conference might create a project in OSF and then use it to allow presenters to share their materials, um, so slides and other things. Uh, and make those things available to attendees either during the sessions and or after the sessions. And I want to put in a plug for NC Docs while we're here. This, of course, is our open access repository of UNCG scholarship, and it will provide a profile for you where you can share your scholarship through open access. It doesn't track citations, but it does show some other download counts. So you can see views of your work. Um, which isn't, of course, exactly the same as citations, but it can give you one picture of use. And for um, folks who have open access mandates where you have to share your works publicly, NC Docs may be able to help with fulfilling that. Here's an example of a profile. We see a little bit of information about Terry Shelton, info that she has provided to us. And then we would, if we scrolled down, we would see a list of her publications and we see when they were published as well as the number of views that they have had. Why would you use this? It's an easy way to share full text, open access versions of your scholarship. And studies have shown that sharing work openly means it, it, it will increase readership of your work, which likely leads to higher citations. You can see those download counts, have that openly accessible profile. And if you're interested in supporting open access, this is a great way to do that. I do want to note, though, we can't necessarily add everything to NC Docs. We do take care of checking publisher permissions to make sure we can get copyright clearance. But there are some, uh, some publishers that don't allow open access. So NC Docs, for, for some people, won't show all of their works. How do you get or update a profile? We try to make it very easy. You can email us at ncdocs at uncg.edu, send documents, 
maybe copies of articles or presentation slides, or you can send a publication list that might be your CV or just maybe here are the last two or three articles that I've published um, and the titles and, and uh, journals. And then we take care of the rest and we let you know if we have any questions and let you know what we were or were not able to add. Okay, so quickly, we're gonna talk about choosing some of these. You may already have a good idea of which ones of these may be useful to you. Um, but a quick comparison for the main ones that we've talked about today, NC Docs, ORCID, Google Scholar Citations, Scopus Author ID, and Researcher ID, all of them, except for Google Scholar, will offer a persistent identifier, a number. So Google Scholar is really actually profiling you based on your name and your discipline to assign or attach certain publications to you as an author. And I've had to go in with my profile and say, no, this is not mine, or go in and, and search for other things that were not showing up that it had not associated with me. Um, so with that one, you may have to do a little extra checking to make sure that your profile is right. They do make that pretty easy though. All of them offer some kind of user profile. All of them have a publication list for you. NC Docs, of course, is the only one where your work will be openly accessible. They all offer some kind of usage metrics, except for ORCID, that's really not their thing. And all of them, except for Scopus, offer some kind of user privacy. So um, NC Docs, the privacy control there is that if you don't want a profile, you don't ask, ask us for a profile. With ORCID, Google Scholar, and Researcher ID, you can create a profile and then make it only accessible to you. So nothing would show publicly. With Scopus, they don't uh, have any kind of privacy control. Um, ORCID is the one that integrates with the most other systems. Scopus and Researcher ID will integrate with ORCID. Google Scholar doesn't really like sharing data. Um, and NC Docs, of course, it's a UNCG product. And NC Docs and ORCID are the nonprofits here, and the others are for profit companies. Some other quick considerations. If you want to support open access and share full text open access versions of your work, then NC Docs is going to be a helpful one for you in that regard. If you're publishing in scholarly journals and perhaps pursuing grant funding, then you are probably going to want an ORCID. And if you're looking to track citations and metrics, then Google Scholar citations will probably be the most useful one, but you may also want to check out Researcher ID and look to see if Scopus has created a profile for you as well. And just one final note, with any system, whether it's one we've talked about today or others that are out there, don't just think about the benefits. So think about maybe what you may be giving up. Is it gonna be really complicated? Is it going to cost money? What are they going to do with your data? How? Uh, what's their copyright policy with things that might be loaded there? And other things as well. So I would encourage thinking critically about any of the systems that you're considering for uh, research identity purposes. All right. So that is the 35 minute run through on all of these. And if you all have questions, this is a great time to um, you can unmute or enter things in the chat. And um, I've got a resources page with some of those links here at the end. And yeah, I again wanna thank Sam for facilitating this today and uh, everybody for being here. Oh, and Sam has already got the assessment in there. Great job, thanks Sam. So Anna, this was fantastic. I, I really appreciate the depth that you went into in in, um, in all the information. So um, thank you for it. And um, I, Thanks, I hope others who didn't have a chance to watch it today will watch it in the future. I know I shared it with a number of colleagues, some who weren't able to come on today, but I think it's valuable. I think we should share it with you know some of our doctoral students as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. And yes, yeah, this is a great thing for grad students to be thinking about as they're getting started in their scholarly work and thinking about how they want to present 
uh, themselves online and share their work because uh, as we've noted some of these profiles can be used at different institutions um, so it doesn't really matter where you are um, NC Docs is really going to be based at UNCG and it's not going to follow you throughout your career but these others that we've talked about they can be used anywhere so yes that's a great point about students thank you for bringing that up Sam, let me ask you, in, in working with grad students and faculty and your liaison areas, what are the ones that you think are most popular with them? Google Scholar, because it just kind of does the work for you. Um, and like, I just feel like H index is something that has become like universal enough-ish, you know, that uh, they can uh, get there. Um, it also makes you look better than um, Scopus um, because of what they're filtering, feeding from. Um, like you said, mm -hmm. there is course issues with it, but um, yeah, Google Scholar. Yeah. Um, they do use ResearchGate, you know, and I think mm -hmm. once you kind of talk them through positives and negatives, like they get it, um, but you know, Though ResearchGate has issues, like it's has a very powerful presence within Google, yeah. you know. So when yeah. you're like finding stuff and looking at stuff, um, that shows up a lot. Um, the big thing is I for my me and when working with grad students also, I use it as a lesson too within um Google Scholar and peer review and how they tag scholarly works. Um you know, because a lot of times they might think they're looking at a peer reviewed article, but it's a preprint or it's a um, like report, maybe, or, mm -hmm. you know, a conference proceeding, um, you know, dissertation. Uh, they they tag, they don't have any tag for that in Google Scholar. So um, it's, it's a good, it's a good lesson and a conversation with grad students as well. Um, but the free stuff is, is of course not to be ignored. Like, you know, um, not every institute that they end up with um, or career they end up with is going to have Scopus or mm -hmm. Web of Science. Yeah. Jenny said that uh, I like Google Scholar personally because a lot of my publications are book chapters and they show up there a lot more consistently yeah. in other places. Um, yeah, and like, I like how Google Scholar, you can just like easily add stuff to. Mm -hmm. um, like I was just looking at my profile when you were talking and I was like, oh, I could add some stuff. Um, and it's just so easy. <laughs> you just do it right there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, great point. And in, in fact, I, I looked at Google Scholar this morning, like scrolled all the way down, and it also will have like um, conference presentations. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I did that. I mean, because yeah. this was long. But one yeah. thing, um, you know, I've been married now 30 years, so my name is hyphenated, but I knew I had two publications um, when I was not married. Um, and so I couldn't find them on Google Scholar. And interestingly enough, so I thought, I know, I'll just look in PubMed. And I type Lori Kennedy in PubMed. And it didn't show up. Now, these were both published in 1987. But interestingly enough, which I thought was sort of strange, another Lori Kennedy showed up. And I thought what was interesting was her area of interest was in gerontology. So I thought that was that was interesting. She's up in Canada. But I was curious to I, I the two articles I published in 87, I know were cited a lot, but I just was curious like to mm -hmm. see. So I didn't know how far back these systems go. I think that's yeah. why I'm asking the question. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question and a great point. The systems don't always understand when people's names have changed. That's can be a real stumbling block with some of these systems. And in terms of the back um, content, some of it is going to depend on the journals and whether or not they were published um, in print, if their work is available online, like Google may not know about it if it was just uh, print focused and that if the info has not been put online. Um, so it's it's going to vary based on what metadata is out there and what's been um, digitized or even just the citations digitized. So yeah, that some of the older stuff just may not show up in the same way. It's a good question. Jenny, you got, you've got your hand up. Yes, hello, thank you. This is actually something I just saw like an hour ago and I wanted to ask about. Um, I was, uh, I'm teaching a couple of Zotero workshops this week and I was in Zotero and I noticed there, I guess I've seen it before, but I haven't paid attention to it. But in my library, there's a My Publications 
something. And I was like, oh, cool, I'll move something over there. And then it gave me this note that said like that would show up on the Zotero dot on my Zotero.org page. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I don't know and about that. It's, there, not, um, it it's all, been there so. for a little over a year. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, and did it ask you for uh uh it's like a new like if you go to Zotero.org, you can find it. I just can't remember where. Oh, um, I just panicked and didn't do it. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I was I like, I don't know where it shows up on the website in a while, but I think that's their response to Mendeley. So is this think, a okay. new kind of profile piece that they're yes, allowing? But it's very, I mean, a year is still like, I haven't messed with it a lot because I mean, mm -hmm. um, Mendeley, my experience with Mendeley is that um, uh, some, I, I mostly hear about it in STEM and health sciences. I'd be curious if y'all in the humanities like hear about it a lot or, um, but um, yeah, people are shaking their head. Yeah, um, in public health, and I think there's like a couple people who use it, you know, because it's just, you know, they used it in other institutions and, and brought it over. Um, but I think that's their way of kind of trying to compete with that they, you know, like feed off of those alt metrics. And some people mm -hmm. might, you know, uh, say, I want to go to Mendeley over Zotero because of that. Um, but one of the reasons we didn't, I mean, Jenny knows more about this context than me, but one of the reasons I thought we went with Zotero as an open source platform was that they were not owned by Elsevier. Um, and we had questions, right, about the data and like what they were doing, like, you know, because there's, you know, some kind of, I guess, privacy issues of if they're like, you know, they're tracking what you're saving and um, what well, you're reading. Way. Yeah. 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 We, we went with, so, well, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. I, I still think Zotero is the best one. Um, and I think like just in terms of functionality, but um, that did play into it. And Mendeley has changed a lot over the years, but we, we did consider it um, when we had to lose Web of Science and therefore in no web. So well, the nice thing about Zotero in terms of sharing your scholarship with that My Publications is that, you know, um, you can now like it, you can drag and drop things into there, right? So like if you have a PDF, um, you know, that you're like even from NC Docs, right? And, uh, you know, the way they nicely ingest those uh, PDFs into there, um, you can just drag and drop it into there and um, it will read the metadata or um, you could even manually input the metadata and then you could export a bibliography um, for a grant or for a resume or things like that. Um, so it's a nice, I think it's a nice little feature. I mean, I try mm -hmm. to keep mine up to date, but it doesn't give you any, um, and I haven't played around with the Zotero.org one, but if I'm like right clicking on it, it doesn't like take me anywhere. So I'll have to look at where I can find that on Zotero.org. Anyway. Yeah, this is kind of, the, it's kind of a rabbit hole when you get into some of these systems with learning about the functionalities and the amount of time that you can sink into some of these. Um, so uh, that, that may be fun or it may not be the right time for, for everyone in terms of diving into some of these. Um, so it's, it's 145. I, so we are going to wrap up. But again, I appreciate all of y'all being here and the comments and the questions. And Sam, um, thank you again for facilitating and running this yeah. webinar series. Um, so just as right before you all leave, I guess I should have done this earlier in the chat. Sorry. But the next one, um, which is relevant to a lot of y'all, um, not all of you, is on PubMed Tips and Tricks by Leah Leininger, our, um, one of our health sciences librarian. Um, so definitely check that out. Leah is really good at PubMed. Um, she trained me on PubMed. So, uh, you know, uh, I'll be there. <laughs> so definitely check it out. And then other ones we have coming up throughout this spring semester are um, one on non-traditional library, student library spaces um, or non-traditional library spaces in general. Um, including our family room and things like that. And then the last one is on bringing primary sources into the classroom by uh, Stacey Krim and Kathleen Smith from Special Collections from our university, archive, Special Collections and University Archives. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, so thanks you all for coming. I dropped the assessment in the chat. Um, you'll get an email follow up with the recording um, on YouTube with the transcript and all that stuff. Um, and definitely sign up for more or let me know if you have any questions about this series um, or anything. You're welcome to email Anna too. Um, thanks, y'all. Have a good week. Bye. See you later.